Indigenous women and girls are one of the country's most vulnerable populations when it comes to violent crime. According to the federal government, they face high rates of homicide and are more than twice as likely to experience sexual assault than women of any other race. It's an issue Arizona is taking more seriously. At the Capitol Museum in Phoenix, we saw how stakeholders came together this week. I will try to go. How much can my pastor boy do either? I want to go. Oh, I'll not be the topper. A ceremonial bill signing Tuesday began with a prayer and signaled the start of a search for answers. HB 2570, the law of the land. The new law establishes a 21-person committee tasked with studying how Arizona can reduce and end violence against indigenous women and girls. Democratic State Representative Jennifer Germain sponsored the bill in the House, which passed both chambers with unanimous support. The purpose and the goal of the task force is to get to better numbers for the state of Arizona so that we can start attacking the root cause of the problem and putting resources uh, in those areas. The lack of reporting on cases involving indigenous women and girls led the Urban Indian Health Institute to label it a data crisis when it looked into the issue last year. Its findings paint a bleak picture in Arizona. Out of 506 missing and murdered cases in 71 urban cities, Tucson tied for the third highest number of cases at 31. Nationwide, Arizona also ranked third for most overall cases at 54. Germain says bringing law enforcement agencies across the state together could change that. We're hoping to become uh, the gold standard of response, uh, get all of our agencies talking together, um, get all of our agencies working together and to stop people from going missing and cases from going cold when they cross jurisdictional lines. Everybody can relate to somebody being a victim or a victim themselves. In 2009, Elaine Gregg's seven-year-old daughter, Rhea Dene Almeida, was sexually assaulted and murdered by a friend's older brother in Ajo. It was a warm summer day. She, everybody was usually inside during the daytime. She, she was really a tomboy, so she was more of an outside person, uh, which we all loved and adored about her. Um, she was wanting to go to her friend's house who lived down the street. So this was the only time I had really allowed her to go by herself. I watched her cross the busy road, and um, that was my last time I seen her. She went to visit a friend. The friend wasn't there, but his older brother was there. Rhea's killer was convicted and sentenced to life in prison. Greg believes the outcome may have been different if her daughter had been older or if the crime had happened on tribal land. Two factors that she says could have led to less attention on the tragedy. And just from different stories that go on within our tribal community, um, there's people who have committed similar crimes who get seven years, six, seven years. So they're, they're free to walk after that. And I can't imagine what that kind of trauma still holds within their family and their community. Arizona joined several other states in passing measures this year that concern missing and murdered indigenous women and girls. Jermaine credits more indigenous women serving in office for raising awareness across the country. Community activist April Ignacio says grassroots efforts also amplified the issue at the state capitol. The support of the study will tell the 22 distinct tribes in Arizona that you are listening to them. Ignacio co-founded Indivisible Tohono, an advocacy group focused on legislative issues impacting the Tohono O'odham Nation. She describes her work collecting data about violent crimes against Native women and girls as unofficial research that began as a way to honor victims and let their loved ones know they are not forgotten. HB 2570 is a start. It's, it's a start. It's necessary. Um, I would like to see appropriations. I would like to see dollars um, to back this up. That would tell me that Arizona is serious. Jermaine says the committee received about $150,000 from the Office of Arizona Attorney General Mark Burnovich. Members will include legislators, tribal council members, and community leaders. They officially begin work on August 27th, and by November of 2020, they're expected to produce a report recommending ways to address the issue, from new legislation to increased services for victims. The biggest thing that we're doing to try to ensure that that the report and the recommendations are honored is we're building those relationships with key lawmakers, with, with the governor's office, with the attorney general's office, with the FBI, with Congress, 
with the tribal leaders to ensure that whoever is sitting in this in this seat in 2021 is able to keep pushing forward. Indian tribes don't usually have that of a, a strong relationship with those elected representatives. And I think that is step number one, um, is to start building these relationships. Those close to the issue know it will take more money and resources to achieve change, but for now they can agree. Legislation like this is a step in the right direction. I feel I, you know, it brings back that sadness, but I feel really uplifted and hopeful, and I believe that hope trumps fear, and I'm hoping that we can eventually get to that place across our, our state, across our, our nation. So, yeah, I'm feeling really good. Today's a good day.